we've been focused on, on this conference on the use of autonomous weapons, autonomous technology for is weapons. And I want to press, preface my remarks by saying that I, you know, I believe war is a human failing. Um, and so I, I don't think of any weapon, uh, even if it's necessary to be a, for, a force for good. But it's in the larger context of uh, autonom autonomy, which are greatly improved computer systems that in outside the military context can have great value, um, in including some pretty amazing technologies that could result in uh, better medicine, uh, b better search and rescue, uh, of a variety of, of different um, uh, sources. So what are, what, are, what are autonomous technologies and what's their application in, in the warfare environment? Autonomous technologies really are uh, uh, systems, computer systems, that are, uh, can effectively uh, engage in a variety of con uh, conduct without any human intervention. A human turns them on, they run, they do their thing without any human intervention. In the context of autonomous weapons, this means weapon systems that you can deploy in a battlefield that can make its own targeting decisions and make the decision whether to engage in, uh, or not engage with that, with that weapon system. Uh, so what I want to focus on are some of the legal issues that arise from the deployment of autonomous weapon systems. Again, these are systems that you turn them on, put them in the battlefield, and they make decisions who to target, what to target, and, and actually engage in the target without any human being involved uh, in the system. So that's what we mean by autonomous weapon systems. Uh, in this area of war, any weapon system has to meet, before you engage or use a target using a weapon system, any use of a weapon system requires you requ meet certain requirements for international law. I don't want to turn this into a long lecture on international law, so I'm going to really give the headlines happy in discussions to talk about uh, other issues. But, but largely what international law says is that any weapon can only be used to target a legitimate military target. And uh, when you, even after you've chosen that target, you have to take steps to minimize uh, civilian casualties. And the final step is, if you are going to use a weapon and you've decided that you know what the likely civilian casualties are going to be and you've minimized them, you need, then need to make a judgment about whether the value of the target uh, justifies the civilian um, uh, deaths that can occur. It's sort of a proportionality. If it's a very low value military target, few of any uh, civilian casualties uh, can often be justified. If it's a very high value target, uh, more civilian casualties can be justified. It's a judgment call, but it's proportional. Uh, we had a discussion earlier, and I, I gave the opinion, I'll give it now again, is that in most circumstances, uh, under the existing technology, it's my judgment, uh, with a few caveats that I'll go into, that most, uh, the use of most autonomous weapon systems in most battlefields cannot comply with this international legal requirements. Either it's, it, they cannot adequately distinguish between military targets and civilian targets, the technology is not there yet, or they cannot make the proportional uh, proportionality judgment. There really is a judgment call, uh, and so cannot be uh, again useful or effective in the battlefield. But that's now. That's the technology is as they now exist, and as um, uh, my colleague will, will describe, there are a lot of issues that may even arise after you just determine that, 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 that the technologies can comply with international law. The, I said there were some caveats, and the caveats I want to give are there are some uh, systems I can imagine that in some circumstances, civilians are not going to be present, such that the use of these weapons can be justified under international human, human uh, rights law. Uh, let me give you some examples. Uh, right now we have uh, missile defense systems on our destroyers, the Aegis, called the Aegis systems. And right now there's a human um, on the loop, a human being supervising the use of the machine. But let's imagine that we had an, an Aegis destroyer that was in the middle of the ocean uh, that was fully autonomous, which is something that we, we could do. Uh, would that comply with international law? And in those circumstances, I think it probably could, because you're in a space where there are no civilians, it targets not human beings, but missiles. 
Uh, and therefore, the issues of distinction and proportionality that talked about really don't come into play. And you can also imagine in the near future, as the technology gets better, there are other parts of the battlefield where the threat to humans, civilians, is low enough that, 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 that this issue will become alive uh, sooner rather than later. One of the best examples is under, undersea anti-submarine warfare. Given that submarines under, underwater are, with a few exceptions, largely only a military activity, there aren't many people going on cruises in submarines. It really is a military environment. A weapon that could that only targets submarines, and that the, te the technology gets good enough that they, they will only target submarines and not other things underwater, could potentially comply with, with international law because it's operating in an environment where there are no civilians. The final example I'll, I will give, um, which um, may be rare now, but in the past hasn't been, would be um, desert tank warfare where um, you're talking about anti-tank weapons only, um, again, in an environment where it's highly unlikely that many civilians would be present and it's clearly targeted toward military uh, targets. But right now, in the, the environments, the kind of battles that we're now fighting in Afghanistan and have fought in Iraq, the sort of counterinsurgency, urban warfare, as you can imagine, the issues become even more challenging because you're in an environment where the enemy may not wear a web, have a may not wear a uniform. You're in an environment where perfectly law-abiding citizens who are not involved in insurgency routinely carry weapons, um, and in an environment where you may have one element that is involved in in a in a in a conflict with the United States or in, or, the, or, or Great Britain, while another element may not be. So the kinds of judgments, in a messy battlefield intermixed with lots of civilians. Um, and it, it's in that environment that I think we're gonna, years away from, from being uh, an effective um, use of autonomous weapon systems. So that is sort of the landscape as I see it now, um, where I think we effectively have, by application of traditional principles of international humanitarian law, a ban or a prohibition or a moratorium that may go away if the technology gets better but right now that effectively exist for most uh, offensive uses of autonomous weapon systems. Um, but that could change as the technology gets better. And then, it, in my view, that then raises the fundamental question. And the fundamental question is, if we reach a time when these weapon systems are able to comply with international law, they can distinguish who a civilian is, who a military member is, they have a method of making the proportionality analysis. Are there other reasons that we would nonetheless want to ban these weapons? They would not be banned under international humanitarian law, but, um, but there may be other um, values at stake that, that come into play. I agree with Charles that uh, war is an incredible failing of human beings. I also think that the mad clamor for turning anything new, any technology new, into some military use to further dehumanize war is a horrific human failing. And that we sit back and accept it is another human failing. I'm, I'm going to talk a little personally and about the, what we in the campaign to stop killer robots are trying to accomplish and why. Do you want to tell people about the campaign? Yes, that's part yeah. of my thing. Good, good. <laughs> that's Stay part on. of where I'm going, good, people. Good. Thank you. Um, some years ago, I wrote an article about the CIA, the mercenaries the United States of America uses, and the US Army and the use of drones illegally in extrajudicial execution. In that process, I learned about these new technologies in which at some point in time, if undisturbed, would become fully autonomous weapons of war. Drones pose their own issues, and I have issues with drones. 
but we have to think about a drone. At, at the very least, there is a human being that makes the target and kill decision. Right? The drone can fly for thousands of miles relatively on its own, but it cannot on its own mm, hone in on you and decide, oh, there's a terrorist, and kill you. There is a human being having to look to make some sort of assessment, and we can argue whether or not the assessments are accurate, and has to kill you. But the human being has to do the killing. Um, that already causes people huge emotional issues. And, and I don't say that in a girly way, like, oh my god, we can't stand this. It's the dehumanization of war. It's the ability of technologically advanced, whatever that means, in war nations to keep their people away from the conflict itself and inflict lethal damage on another people. Um, some of us believe that is profoundly wrong. And taking it the next step to removing the human being from even looking at the computer screen or pushing the buttons to fire the missiles to kill you is a step that humanity must not take. And one of the things that I noted in the conversations today, there are a lot of uh, people who actually develop these weapons and some military lawyers. And as you know, Shakespeare said, kill the lawyers first. <laughs> but I won't elaborate on that. It was really fascinating discussion. But what did not get discussed is the ethics and morality of making the choice, because it is a choice, to allow, to cede the power of life and death to machines. And instead, there was conversation about, and I certainly believe in the laws of war because it was based on the laws of war that we were able to ban anti-personnel landmines and subsequently cluster munitions. I am a firm supporter of the laws of war. But I don't think that fully autonomous robots that can kill you is really fundamentally an issue of the laws of war. I think it is a profoundly moral and ethical issue that we have to, as a people, address. And that was the conversation that ultimately led to a group of nine organizations, I think we're nine, coming together and deciding to create a campaign to stop killer robots. And that we should raise alarm bells, that we should help inform the public that these weapons are being developed in our name. I firmly believe that um, the military did not expect this to become a public issue. I think that they ex and the developers expected it would just kind of go along and, you know, everything would be nice and the development would continue and then suddenly, you know, we'd hear after it had, these weapons had been used in some war, oh, by the way, we have these weapons. And <clears throat> we do not agree that that is the way we should go. Obviously, since we have worked very hard on banning landmines and banning cluster munitions and the new treat, arms trade treaty, we firmly believe in the concept of humanitarian disarmament. We firmly believe that everybody in a society has the right and the responsibility to participate in discussions about this, instead of just letting the military and the government say, oh, we're protecting your security. I'm like, wait a minute, that's not my definition of security. Spending billions of dollars on technology that may or may not work is not making me a safer human being on this planet. While the poverty rate in my country goes up, while the public school systems fall apart, we're perfectly willing to spend billions of dollars on weapons and not on the needs of humanity. That's a human failing. 
So we created the international, no, we're not international. Yes, we are. The campaign to stop killer robots. And within eight months, we launched in April last year here in London, as a matter of fact. Um, within about eight or nine months, we had raised the profile enough that governments have started discussing killer robots. Um, there will be discussion under the banner of the Convention on Conventional Weapons. I won't bore you with the details of that convention, that treaty, but there will be discussion in May in Geneva, and we will be there putting forth our position. Um, because we believe it is a moral and ethical step that we cannot take. My country likes to talk about, um, and I have, I'm an American, so I'm gonna talk from an American perspective since we, along with Israel, the UK, are the primary leaders, if you will, in the development of these technologies. The US likes to talk a lot about a bloodless battlefield. What does that mean? The bloodless battlefield is that US pilots at this point sit in Nevada and kill people in Somalia, in Yemen, in Pakistan. I'm not sure where else they did in Libya they were used. Um, what it is bloodless is for the American people so that they do not have to see their own people come home in body bags and raise discussions about war. It is not a bloodless battlefield. It, is, it would be a system of war that so imbalances the ability of the so-called enemy to fight back that it, it really, to me, defies thinking. It makes me worry about the future of humanity. If we step to that point where we think it's okay to, set, to give a machine the ability to kill you. I don't care how much it might help in one battle in the middle of a desert. I don't care. Because once those weapon systems are deployed, the slippery slope will happen and they will be used in other circumstances because it's useful. We do not want to see that happen. And we keep being told that, oh my God, you, you know, you're going to affect dual use technology. Oh my God, you know, we don't know yet what we can do with these weapons, so a ban is premature. I don't wanna know what we can do with these weapons. I wanna ban now so that we do not have to contemplate machines that can kill on their own. We are not anti-technology. We are not against robots. They're fine. What we are against is the use of robotic systems to create weapons that can kill you on their own. We're not necessarily against some robotics weapon systems. We are against lethal robotic systems that can kill you on their own with no soldier involved. That's what we want to ban. We don't want to stop research into artificial intelligence. If Google wants to have a car that can drive on its own, go for it. If Amazon wants to deliver my books by its own little drone helicopter, I just don't want them to drop it on my head. That is not what we're particularly concerned about. We are concerned about weapons that continue to dehumanize war and make it easier and easier for the technologically advanced nations of the world to kill people who don't have the same technology. And that is morally and ethically wrong. And to extract the morality and the ethics from the discussion is also wrong. And yet when activist campaigners like myself want to talk about morality and ethics in the development of weapon systems, you know, it's like, uh, look at, listen to her. Listen to her, she gets all emotional. Because I speak with passion about my belief that we should not cross this moral and ethical line does not mean I'm emotional. It means that I am appalled 
that mostly men, I'm really sorry, gentlemen, mostly men sit in Washington and in the defense industry funded by billions of US taxpayer dollars think up these machines and think they're cool. And I have, heard, I have seen quotes about people in the development of these robotic systems thinking they're just so cool. There's nothing cool about creating more weapons that keep a few people safe while they kill people who have very little alternative, where they kill people who have no chance of surrender. One of the big issues about the use of drones is what if one of those people that's targeted wanted to surrender? They are judged, killed, immediately they can't, there's no, no, no chance of surrender. We won't even go into the, you know, 30 some odd people that were killed at a wedding ceremony in Yemen recently. Um, because there's not collateral damage, because precision is the name of the new technology. One of the horrors of war today is the constant belief that we can find the precise technological solution to our problems. We cannot. War, as Charles said, is a failure of human beings. It is a lust for power and resources and greed. That will never be resolved by killer robots. It will only be resolved when we, as a teeny and getting teenier world, start thinking differently about how we resolve our problems. And that is not a utopian hoo-hoo. That you get what you prepare for. And if we keep preparing more and more sophisticated weapons, to go kill people, we're just going to get more and more and more war that's easier to go to. That is another huge concern about robotic weapons. Already, I believe that we, we in my country, <coughs> have been able to attack Somalia, Yemen, Pakistan, because there aren't boots on the ground. What would we do if we didn't have drones? Would we send people in there? Would we send, you know, platoons of army people in there? Imagine the day when we have huge weapon systems that are fully autonomous and nobody has to think about it at all. <clears throat> Thus, we created the campaign to stop killer robots. And we will be doing more. I want to read you something. We are engaging in expanding our campaign, engaging in more public discussion like this so that people are aware, so that people exercise their responsibility, so that people exercise their individual power and take a stand on how, what you want done in your name with your money. Because by the way, the UK is right up there, the Tyrannus system, it's, you know, a precursor of a fully autonomous, supersonic, hoo-hoo, super drone. That's your tax dollars. Say nothing about Trident missiles, but I won't go into the nuclear question at this point, although I could. I'm going to read you a line from uh, <coughs> an article called um, The Rise of the Machines. Why increasingly perfect weapons help perpetuate our wars and endanger our nation. It is written by Lieutenant Colonel Douglas A. Pryor, active duty U.S. Army. He was a military intelligence offer, officer, he's still active duty, who has served in Iraq, Kosovo, Germany, the U.K., the United States, and most recently Afghanistan. So I, I kind of feel like he knows of what he speaks. And he's talking mostly about drones here. But I have, we communicate, and I asked him if what he wrote here was equally applicable to killer robots, and he wrote back and said, absolutely yes. This is what he writes about the dehumanization of war and the impact on my own country, but it would be similar for others. Some of us are not only dehumanizing others as evil terrorists in order to justify our use of these weapons,
but all Americans are being dehumanized in the process. The face that America shows her enemies, shows foreign populations, and shows co coalition allies in these countries where the US patrols exclusively with armed drones is a wholly inhuman face. Our enemy hides from and occasionally fires at machines. Our enemy who is at war with America is at war with machines. America, home to a proud, vibrant people, has effectively, effectively made itself inhuman. Such willful self-dehumanization is tantamount to a kind of slow moral suicide, motivating our enemies to fight and prolong our current wars. It is troubling just how financially, politically, and militarily committed my nation is to a course of action that encourages the very worst of human impulses. I'm proud that a, an active duty lieutenant colonel in the US Army would say this publicly. You can find it in the Military Review, March, April 2013. Uh, I fully agree with him that if we proceed along this path in my country or globally, we are further dehumanizing war, and it is immoral and unethical. And I can assure you that the campaign to stop killer robots will do everything we can to stop killer robots in all circumstances, no offense. I like you, Charles. <laughs> I don't always like your position. <laughs>